Welcome back. This is the last session for today of our Irish Writers Weekend. Uh, my name's Jamie Andrews. I lead at the British Library on our public programming. Uh, the Irish Writers Weekend, it's the first Irish Writers Weekend. I hope the first, but definitely not the last. It's taking place today and tomorrow here in the Shaw Theatre and over at the British Library on the other side of the road. And this weekend is for us at the British Library, it's a culmination of a whole year of fantastic island-related programming that we've been doing, all of which has been about building and strengthening our relations with the Irish cultural and heritage sector. Uh, since this is the last, uh, the last session of the day, uh, I'm going to do some thanks. Uh, and firstly, just to say how absolutely thrilled we have been to partner on this weekend with the Corch International Festival of Literature. Uh, and massive thank yous to the Corch team, uh, Manuela, Ashleen, and uh, the former director, Sasha, who you'll see in a minute. Uh, thank you also for your support to Culture Island and the Embassy of Ireland in the UK. Uh, we have long valued, long valued our relationship with the Irish Embassy. It's been fantastic to have the Irish Ambassador to the UK with us today. Thank you to our hotel partner as well, the Doyle Collection, who have been doing that most important of things, which is to give our visiting writers a roof, and indeed a very elegant roof over their heads this weekend. Uh, we're really grateful to you for coming on board with us. Uh, and thank you to our friends and neighbours here at the Shaw Theatre as well. Our theatre at the British Library is currently out of action, and we're very grateful that you've stepped in to help us host this event in uh, the most appropriate of spaces, the Shaw Theatre, named after that great Irish writer. Uh, and finally, thanks as well to John, to B, to Amal, and to all of the BL team. Uh, do pop by if you are with us this weekend, if you're with us tomorrow, do pop by the British Library next door. We'll be hosting one of the sessions, uh, exceptionally but excitingly, one of the sessions in one of our stunning reading rooms. So that's a great opportunity to see one of those spaces. But pop by the building as well. We're open all day. It's open to the public. Uh, and if you have time, come to our Treasures Gallery, our permanent gallery. It's free entry. And in that gallery, you can see the most extraordinary uh, introduction to our vast collections that go back more than 3,000 years. Uh, thank you to you as well, of course, for being here, for supporting the festival this weekend. Uh, I hope you enjoy the final session that's coming up today with award-winning actor Robert Sheehan, who is going to be joined virtually on the screen by the equally award-winning novelist Donald Ryan. Now, at the end of the conversation, Robert will be over at the main British Library building. It's just over the road, just cross the road, you'll be there. He'll be over signing copies of his debut collection, Disappearing Act. Uh, but be sure to pick up a copy of Donal's acclaimed novel, The Queen of Dirt Island 2, which will also be on sale. Uh, and now, to host uh, both of them, please welcome our chair for this session, the writer and the former festival director of Coach, Sasha De Ball, who'll be coming out with Robert Sheehan. Thank you very much. You can stand at the lectern if you like. I mean, whatever you like. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Yeah, welcome. Hi. Um, familiar faces, any family members, any nemeses? Yeah, any anyone? Any, any enemies in the audience now? No. Raise your hands. Late. <laughs> Didn't make it. Yeah, yeah. They anyway. might sneak in the back during <laughs> the event. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for coming tonight to this, the last event of our first day of the Irish Writers Weekend London. Um, as Jamie mentioned, this is a partnership event between Court International Festival of Literature and the British Library. Uh, it's been the culmination of about a year's worth of partnership building, so it's, it's really, really, really wonderful to be here. Um, I'm Sasha de Boyle, and I am so thrilled to be here tonight to have a conversation about stories across genres, generations and diaspora with Robert Sheehan and Donal Ryan, who is joining us uh, from the ether. <laughs> so welcome, Donal. Can you hear us okay? Can, sure can. Thanks, how's, Sasha. How's the ether treating you? Great. I, I, I didn't realise I'd be so massive, actually, on stage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but my bookshelf would be so bright yellow. 
You're, I, on, you're, I on kind of six, saw... you're on an 18 foot screen, man. Yeah. <laughs> Your head is huge. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the way that the uh, conversation will go tonight is uh, I'll do a bit of an introduction and then we'll have readings from Dolan and from Rob. Uh, Rob or Robert? Don't mind? Whichever, I don't really mind. Grant? I've been um, called worse. <laughs> well, hopefully it will not come to that. Yeah, it so might. Not. You never know, you never know. Um, then we'll have a bit of a conversation. There'll be time for questions from the audience and then we'll finish up, as Jamie mentioned, with a book signing across the road at the British Library and I hope you'll join us. And also, as you mentioned, I hope you will pick up both of these beautiful books, Disappearing Act by Robert Sheehan, which is here on this table, and The Queen of Dirt Island, uh, which is in my bag at the back, <laughs> but also for sale at the British Library shop. So yeah, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Robert. Hey. Big round of applause. Hey. Hey. Thanks. Uh, thanks all of you for coming. I really appreciate it. It's very new territory for me, you know, yeah. all this being invited to literary festivals. <laughs> yeah. It's new ground. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to wear or how I'm supposed to behave. You know. I think the thing is, is you can actually just do what you like because <laughs> it, no matter what you do, they'll be like, "Oh, you're an artist." Oh, Very edgy. eccentric. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so we'll start off with some readings. Uh, Rob, how do you feel about going first, or would you like Donald to go first? I'll go first. Why not? Okay. You know, so I'll, I'll I'll do an intro if that's okay for you. Um, yeah. Robert Sheen is best known as an actor with screen credits including *Season of the Witch*, *The Mortal Instruments*, *Moonwalkers*, *Geostorm*. Uh, the Red Riding Trilogy, multi-IFTA winning Love Hate, Misfits, for which he was BAFTA nominated, The Borrowers, and The Umbrella Academy. I did not know you were in The Borrowers. Yeah. For real, I loved those books. I'll have to watch that. Yeah, it was great. They, took, they coated all of our clothes in that book binding glue. <laughs> which was weird. Real. Um, Theatre includes The Playboy of the Western World, The War of the Roses, and Endgame. Disappearing Act is his debut collection of short stories, which we'll be yeah. reading from today. So would you like to tell us a little bit about the book before you start? Yeah, like all my life I've really liked writing, you know, if ever I was on a train I'd sort of get stuck into a notebook and be writing lots of stuff and um, it was always for fun really writing, I really enjoyed, uh, I suppose it was a form, a sort of a form of creativity, you know, and um, and then you know what? Like, there, there, was a, there, was a, there was a moment in Los Angeles where uh, I used to live there years ago and I was at this charity function and there was a deputy editor of a magazine and she, I said to her, I'd write an article for your magazine. And she went, all right, what would it be about? And I, <laughs> I said, uh, uh, shadow puppetry. And she went, what? <laughs> I went, yeah, you know. And then I, I didn't write anything. I, you know, just a sort of a passing thing. And then a couple of weeks later, it was kind of niggling at me and I tried to write something. And I, I was kind of doing a bit of research online, but like everything that I tried to write as part of this kind of self-imposed assignment, I absolutely hated. It just, it just came out as, as, as word turd on the page. <laughs> right? And then, then I just sort of started writing as if like, uh, you know, I'm just having a chat with someone that I know and I like and I trust, you know? And, tried to, and I realized that my, like the, the stuff that I'd hated was was school. I was basically, I was I was writing like a textbook. You know, I was trying to. I was. I don't know who writes textbooks, but the ones that we were made to study in school were profoundly boring. You know, boringly written, and mo a lot of the humanity was sort of stripped away out of them. You know, it was strange. And so, when I was trying to do something in a kind of a real way, it came out like a weird textbook. It was it was odd, and so I had to kind of shake off that conditioning and then then I started writing like as soon as I sort of started to f feel more of a voice in writing then loads of little kind of thought bubbles and little kind of little farts popped out on the notes section of my phone where where uh, I suppose the the kind of raw material or the very very beginning grains of this started where I was just trying to kind of making myself chuckle um, taking down little sort of little things and so that was years you know that was you know there was bits and pieces that have sort of evolved into stories that was back in 2015 mm -hmm. and then uh, I started taking it a little bit more seriously around 2019 and sort of cobbled together maybe seven or eight very again very sort of embryonic short stories 
and showed them to guild books who were incredibly encouraging, who sort of went, yeah, no, but, but, but keep going. You know, there's, there's a kind of a, there's something going on there and you, sh you should keep at it. And maybe come back to us when you have a, a collection that could fill a book, you know, something like 15 or 20. And so I went, all right, I'm going to do it. And I worked really hard on it at that point. And, um, but I still didn't really know what I was writing. You know, I sort of, I was just, you know, the, 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 the stories had like weird punchline-y endings. And mm -hmm. it took, I suppose it took me in a very luxurious way several years, I mean luxurious and not very hard working, several years <laughs> to kind of arrive at a place where I kind of started to hear my voice in a more clarified way. And so then they commissioned the book, Gill Books, God bless them. And, uh, and then this pandemic thing happened. I'm not sure if you noticed, but there was this <laughs> huge global pandemic and it was sort of beautiful timing because I had, I, you know, forced seclusion. I had a contract that I had to fulfill. And I had a, a creative project to focus on. And so it was just, what a gift this thing was for that time, you know. And uh, I also found out how incredibly undisciplined I am when I'm trying <laughs> to write a book, which I'm going to try and pick your brains about later on, Don Ryan, see if you can give me any tips in terms of how you go about editing your books. Um, so, yeah, so where does that bring us up to? Yeah, lockdown, and then just wrote them, rewrote them, rewrote them, rewrote them. And then I realized at a certain point that the, the stuff that sticks, the stuff that's really good, were the kind of chunks that were brought on by the sort of sensation of inspiration. Do you know what I mean? Like, I really like my meditation, and that's kind of laid the groundwork for uh, uh, what I call now the, the sort of sub physical sensation of the subconscious, which happens every now and again, and it feels like this, this invite, and you go, write something, write something, write something, you know. And if you're lucky, you, you write something as a continuation of what you've already written. And so the book evolved out of that feeling, just that one feeling was, it was a feeling that was defined by no thoughts whatsoever. Just, it was what they call flow, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And I, tr I tried to write a book by placing my faith entirely in flow, you know? And so a lot of Irish stuff, childhoody kind of stuff came out. Dysfunctional families from small town Ireland, you know. Uh, and uh, there's, what, there's a story that starts off in kind of small town Ireland. And then there's one at the end that kind of ends the book in small town Ireland. Apart from my father's short story, which is kind of like, ah, oh, Brendan, good of you to join us. <laughs> Sorry, that's my brother. All right, Brendan. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I thought, you know, the one at the end is kind of funny. It's, it's, it's a short story set in a small Irish town, you know, in the spirit of this event mm -hmm. called Salvador Daly. That's the name of the <laughs> short story. So I, I, I'll, I'll give you a blast. I'll give you maybe a couple of pages of the, just for the start off of it. That'd be great. Right. <clears throat> Salvador Daly. Written brackets, mostly brackets, in Los Angeles. I knew this fella in the hometown. He couldn't paint, but he was a <laughs> firebug. A proper little pyromaniac. Cling, cling, you'd hear his zippo go. Cling, cling, early in the morning. Nights close, and he'd be up before the cock crows in the summertime. Roaming through the parish, ears perked for a clock to spoil the silence. And when he heard the alarm going off, cling, he'd be in that bedroom window and on it with the Zippo. Mad coincidence, really, him and the artist fella having such similar names and such similar dislike for clocks. <laughs> Mam says he'd keep us all punctual, would Salvador. At least we've that to be grateful for. I says, yeah, and grateful for another one of God's mysteries that he hasn't been banged up for manslaughter. He'd the whole town trained well enough to wake up seconds before their alarm. Jesus, forgive me. You'd be raging when you'd beat the clock with waking by two minutes, or one minute, or 10 seconds, leaping out of your skin from sleep, cling, where you'd have dreamt them flames. 
If Daly was around your house, he'd melt anything he found trying to tell you the time, to the point where he wouldn't try to hide it. Like, the clock went off and me in the shower once and I didn't hear. I came back in to find the whole bedstead and the headboard all charred and blackened. But the alarm on it still worked for ages. And in school, writhing around or passed out in the desk, the nuns never let him sit at the back anywhere near the coats. He full emptied himself in Brennan's class once, woke up and didn't give a bollocks, didn't even go to the toilet. It stank. It made my eyes water. And it was around that time he stayed up in butchos on some kind of social respite thing during the, first big, during the big trial, till they cleared Fergal and the rest. But no one knows for sure. All sworn to secrecy. Butcho came downstairs one morning and Salvador was using printer paper to set the old grandfather clock alight. It had belonged to Butcho's granddad, been in the family for ages and never told the right time. Butcho to chase him out into the garden with pots and pans, where Salvador had burnt circles into their lawn of grass. And Butcho told me Salvador bars of chocolate stashed out in the tool shed and in under the hedges, all over the place. He found a pound of Kerrygold once hid way up in the Rowan Redberry tree. Butcho's cousin Kev lives about a 25 euro taxi out past Butcho in the sticks. And he said stumbling in at the end of the night, he saw Salvador out there, alone in the field, cartwheeling, cheering, celebrating something Kev couldn't see. Kev's father had to go out with the shotgun once or twice, but give him a fair wide berth. Salvador would have built camps out in the ditch, sure. He'd stay out there days, apparently. He'd eat the grass out of the ground, letting off bangers and howling at the moon. That'll do. Thank you. <laughs> and that was gorgeous. <laughs> you know, a bit full on. <laughs> but um, yeah, you totally had me. Like I was, I was gone. I was like, what? Oh, we're still here. <laughs> cool. Event, I guess. Cool. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. That's all right. Um, I guess we'll we'll head to the ether now. Coming live from the ether, <laughs> Donald Ryan will be doing a reading. Um, Donald Ryan has published six novels and one short story collection, from his debut novel, The Spinning, Spinning Heart, to the most recent book, The Queen of Dirt Island. All of his novels have been number one bestsellers in Ireland. Awards include the Guardian First Book Award, four Irish Book Awards, and he was the first Irish writer to be awarded the John Money Prize for European Literature. And last week he was uh, shortlisted for the Unpost Irish Book Awards for Novel of the Year. So congrats on that, Donald. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. 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 Um, yeah. I really like that uh, Robert's moved his chair around, so it's kind of like we're just here for story time. We're yeah. like, Man, take us away. Story time. <laughs> Okay, um, before I start, actually, if you don't mind, I might read um, the entirety of the um, epigraph from the, the Queen of Dirt Island. Um, Mary O'Malley, my dear friend, and one of the great poets of her time, um, kindly allowed us to use the last verse of her poem, um, History, as an epigraph. Or as an epigram, I'm not sure. I think it's epigraph, yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm going to read um, the whole poem. It's, it's quite short. It's only four verses of four lines each. Um, but I'd like to read the poem in memory of an Irish warrior and goddess, Vicky Phelan. History by Mary O'Malley. This story is about a mother and a daughter, a god taking what he wanted. Demeter's girl. All we know of them is hearsay. Some figures on vases. The woman with her sheaf of corn. Her rage stopped the harvest. Bare shelves brought the gods to the table. This story is about a bargain and a trick, a young girl eating a pomegranate, a seed in her teeth. The girl has no say in our best known versions. We see her climbing from the dark, eyes hurting, the light x-raying her bones, year in, year out. Demeter might have said, stay if it's easier, let the crops rot, but the myth needed growth. This is no time for shady business, the bargains and chains. We too live in important places. Let the books remember the local battles. Rewrite the plot. Let the harvest wither. This is your life. She is your great event. Keep her in the sun. That's history of the million miles for Vicky Phelan. Can you guys hear me okay, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I'm just going to read um, a short chapter from the, 
Queen of Dirt Island called Proposal. Um, and the novel is, um, well, it's a novel set in a, a small house in North Tipperary, and it's pretty much the house where I was reared, um, and I was reared amongst women. Um, so my grandmother kind of um, is a huge influence on the book, um, and my mum, obviously, even though my mum, when she read the manuscript um, as a pile of A4 pages, as she always does, just in case, um, put it down and said, yeah, it's fairly good, though fair play to you. Um, but Jesus, where did you get the one I lived in from? <laughs> It could be none of herself in the character at all. And then, I think that's a good thing, really. I managed to disguise the fact that it's pretty much is my mum. Um, <laughs> but as you know, it's, it's my mum in an alternative universe. Um, mm -hmm. And so at this point in the novel, um, she's being proposed to by the brother of her late husband. And the proposal is witnessed by her daughter, Saoirse, who is 11 at the time. And it's a short chapter called, like all the chapters, called Proposal. Chris proposed to mother on an evening in early summer, with his working clothes on him, as though he'd been seized suddenly by some amorous impulse, some wild <laughs> desire that had been lying dormant. He came rushing down from the fields to the village, half cocked, as Nana said later, though she didn't wholly disapprove of his hastily conceived and poorly executed plan. He stood a long while at the side door, mumbling. Saoirse had never seen a redder face, Mother had stepped back to let him in. She had a cigarette just lit and she was pulling on it deeply. Come in, Chris, she said through a cloud of blue smoke. Er, I won't, Eileen. My boots are covered in muck. I won't drag it in along your clean floor. Er, clean my arse, said Mother. And Chris laughed, a high chuckle, the way he always did. <laughs> Chris enjoyed Mother and she liked him right back. From somewhere, from the ether or the blue heavens, or the fumes of new growth or agricultural diesel, he drew courage and he made his proposal. Eileen, I was wondering, Sir heard him say, wondering what, Chris? I was wondering if it wouldn't be the best thing for all concerned, <laughs> if you and me, if I and you, if you and I, if me and you, and then he said it straight, nearly in a shout, will you marry me? <laughs> Saoirse saw Mother bend forward as though someone had struck her in the stomach. <laughs> and she grabbed this, the lapels of Chris's overalls and pulled him into the kitchen, slamming the door closed in the same movement. Chris's eyes were opened wide in shock. Whatever he'd been expecting, it wasn't to be manhandled off his feet. <laughs> he straightened himself and put a hand over his face and drew it downwards as if to reset himself to regain something of his passive countenance. What kind of rubbish are you talking, Chris? But Chris didn't know, it seemed, what kind of rubbish he'd been talking. <laughs> but Annie Plows, we wouldn't have to, you know yourself, be married in the fullness of the word. We just, you know yourself, take the bad look off of things. <laughs> you have, you know, under the company, yourself and the baby. Baby? Saoirse was 11 years old and she opened her mouth to protest this slight, but some vague wisdom rose from within her and silenced her. Paddy and Chris, her uncles, called her the baby, and maybe they always would. I love you dearly, Chris, said Mother, and I'd be a lucky, lucky woman if I were free to marry you, but I'm still in my heart and soul married to your brother, and I will be, I'd say, for all of eternity. Chris said it was okay. He was sorry. And Mother said she was sorry too, and she kissed his cheek, and Chris dragged himself back up the hillside, and he didn't come down again for a long, long time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant, thank you. Oh, thank you, Thank you so much, Donald. That was lovely. Um, it's so nice to hear like for all that I think Irish writing is wonderful on the page, I think it's incredible to hear Irish writing specifically read aloud. There's something about Hiberno English that just lends itself to reading and performance. And I think I was reflecting on that, especially having you here, Robert, with your background as an actor, and I know Donald's a fantastic reader. And, and yeah, I guess I wanted to, to ask you both if you felt that that kind of, the, the performance of it, the oratory nature of Hiberno English influenced your writing, how, how it kind of formed part of it, and yeah. yeah 
What do you think? Fully qualified oh, to jump in here first. <laughs> Go on, Donald, you kick us off. I'm sorry, now it's a small delay, so I'm probably going to keep interrupting and just looking like a right idiot. Um, it's all right. <laughs> you oh, just sorry. look really keen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, um, to be honest, like the idea of Hiberno English or, you know, the, um, the overlaying of English and the syntax of, of Irish um, mm -hmm. and the retention of phrases and words and ways of saying things and the construction of sentences, it's what actually saved my idea of myself as a writer because like Robert was saying, um, you know, he spent years struggling to kind of find a voice and to start to like mm -hmm. he wrote. And it was the exact same. I mean, I spent 10 years living in a haunted apartment and for half of the time I was almost fully alone. Um, and I had a, for most of the time I had a fairly, um, you know, um, low pressure clerical job. So I had, I mean, I had just oceans of time to write and write <laughs> and every single thing I wrote just rang untrue and just, I hate it. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I. I was insisting um, on writing in a middle-class English voice. Yeah. And for a working-class young fella from Tipperary, um, that was just made no sense. But that's what I thought a writer was. Um, yeah. 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 But just like Rob was saying about the textbooks and that kind of language yeah. being the way you had to write. You know, I had this thing in my head as well. Even though I was, I was fairly well-read, I mean, I didn't, I don't know why I had this notion. But the very simple expedient of writing in a so-called demotic voice just allowed me to, to, to hit that flow that Robert was talking about. I mean, and that's mm -hmm. such an important thing, you know, when you actually get into that state where the world fl falls away and you have that, that mythical thing flow actually working through you um, and a story starting to form itself on the page. Jesus, just the greatest thing of all time. And I think that, that you know, that using my own true voice um, really, really helped in that, in that respect. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, so, you know, some, like sometimes you're trying to write, because so, I don't really speak Irish fluently. I mean, mm -hmm. I've... Kuplafuckle. Very rude, yeah, yeah Kuplafuckle, yeah. yeah, you know, very <laughs> rudimentary Irish I have. But there's sometimes, you know, sometimes where I was write, writing the book, obviously, in English, and there's times, I don't know if you felt this, Don, where just the, the, the corners of English felt a bit wrong, you know? <laughs> it's like there was some, there was a, you know, there was a something I was trying to mean and put across and put down, but the furniture of English just wasn't right for the feng shui, you know? <laughs> And uh, that, 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 that definitely happened to me. I definitely noticed that and sort of made compensation for it. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's, a, that's I suppose, one of the subtler costs of being colonised. Do you for know sure. what I mean? That's, that's kind of... Lads, I am so glad you brought this up in the British Library at the Irish Writers <laughs> Weekend. It's yeah. just, this is exactly where I wanted the conversation to go. No, On seriously, the first I'm delighted. Question. Great, let's talk about it. Yeah, it's you know. It's all right, though, because it, it's yeah, both... There's, of, a, there's it, a rhythm, you yeah. know, there's a kind of a something there that's unconscious, mm -hmm. you know, and when, when it's going well, mm -hmm. you know, as Donald's saying, it, that rhythm wants to come out. Mm -hmm. um, but if it doesn't have the sort of linguistic tools to be represented on yeah. the page, it just doesn't feel... I mean, you know, it, it was, a, it was a, a rare thing, that, you know, but... I mean, uh, you know, to, to try to, to, I suppose, me starting off with that book, to try to make it sound natural, I had to rewrite it like a mm -hmm. hundred times. And did you bring your practice as a performer into it? Like, would you read the work aloud to yeah. try and find the voice? Because I know a lot yeah. of writers do that. Yeah. And I had, I had a real, I had a real hubris that I had to kill at the start. Yeah. <laughs> at the start. As soon as I'd written anything that I was vaguely proud of, I was mad to read it to my uh -huh. friend. <laughs> which was the worst thing ever, because yeah. I go, oh, I've got this little thing, I'll read you this, you know. And then, and then one day, one of my friends looked at me and went, <sighs> and I went, what? You don't think it's great too? <laughs> and, I, you know, I had to, I, I, then I realised the value of speaking the work out loud. Yeah. And, and seeing it bounce off of another ego. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, you know, not land as well as I'd hoped. And... Uh, that was the most, th those were the most valuable times. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. And so, re and then, then I stopped reading. I just put a barrier up and was like, I don't read this anymore. And then, and then, I, and then I had to force myself to read, read it again to people I trust and stuff. Yeah. Um, just to kind of hear it out loud and everything else. So yeah, you know, I, you know, I, I love the, the, the idea of reading it out loud because all of my narrators are relatively unreliable and 
speaking in the first, most of them are speaking in the first person, yeah. you know? And they're speaking in the present tense for the mm -hmm. most part. Because yeah. I wanted, you know, whenever the book, you pick it up now or in a f hundred years, I wanted to feel like the story's happening right this second. You know? Yeah. So for all of that, it does lend itself well to being spoken out loud, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And when you were putting the stories together, did you try like third person, past tense, etc., Or were you like, no, first, like I want these to be kind of stream of consciousness, interiority, you knew where you were going? Yeah, well, yeah, it's sort of, I sort of just, just went with the instinct to keep them most, I mean, there are ones that are in mm. there that are third person, yeah. you know? There are ones that definitely needed to be third person. Yeah. But generally I thought, you know, I'm going to make a, a book of characters before their stories, you know, mm -hmm. the notion of a flawed character who, who for whatever reason, their minds are not at yeah. rest and their restless minds have consequences in the outside world, you mm -hmm. know? And so that felt most pertinent to do it from the first person, yeah. do you know what I mean? That's a lovely point, actually, because in The Queen of Dirt Island, though it's a very different book, Donal, um, I feel like we also are, are presented with, with a couple of really like, richly drawn characters who, whose minds are not at rest, you know, who, who are dealing with a lot of different things. But the form of a novel allows you to get to know them further over time. And then also in the novel, we have a, a third person, which it's odd because it's a quite a close third, but it's also, it's quite dreamy, mm. you know? It, 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 almost, it almost feels like a fable at times. I, I, I would wonder if, if you could say a little bit about that, Donald, and, and where that came from sure. for you. And actually, um, I, I do, I totally agree um, with Rob that, you know, when you're writing the first person, you have this inbuilt immediacy um, and, this, and, and you fully inhabit the characters you write. And I, I mean, I, I was in the first person for most of my, of the last 10 writing years. Um, <laughs> and I, it's just, it's lovely. I mean, it, and it is limited and it's quite hard. It's, it, it's a real challenge to, um, to create an authentic voice that isn't yours in the first person, but I yeah. think it allows you to step almost completely outside of yourself. Um, and it's, mm. it's wonderful, it's really, and it's, it, it makes for very powerful stories, I think, mm. like in Rob's collection. Um, and, but of course, then sometimes you can't use it. You have to be in the third person. Mm -hmm. You have to be almost omniscient, godlike, and you have to create <laughs> something where you can wreak havoc and you can kill and maim and injure with um, abandon. <laughs> yeah. with, the, yeah. with the first person, you get very involved. You know, you really do. Um, and I think and even with a close third, like, I mean, the, most of the vignettes in, in the novel are, um, they're, they're lens through the, the eyes of Saoirse, um mm -hmm. from, she's growing up um, and she, you know, towards the end of it, she's, she's a, grown woman with a child of her own and it it, it kind of um i wanted this to read as a series of impressions um and i wanted you know i wanted it to be something that was easily accessed basically i didn't want anyone to see it as a hard book or you know a book that was going to require mm -hmm. any kind of effort beyond just reading of it um <laughs> you know, yeah. i wanted it to be not easy but just something that would strike a chord because you know i suppose all books are personal to, to the writer um it's, it, I just felt at the time that I wanted the book to be something somebody could read before they went to sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe, maybe think about it, just, to, you know... And as, is, that, as they, is that where the structure came from? For yeah, you well, then? I mean, I have to say I wrote the book in a huge panic because um, <laughs> I spent nearly two years writing a much longer novel um, that I thought, yeah, I was talking about hubris earlier, and hubris is something that flicks and assails all of us at certain times. But, I mean, I, I wrote this long novel in a state of absolute abject hubris thinking this is Jesus, this, this is one of the great novels let's say of all time <laughs> <laughs> my book I'd say this could win the Nobel Prize like you know this is, this is <laughs> and um I, I sent it off to my, my editor and my publisher and they and they must have gotten together and written a really politic and circumspect <laughs> kind of saying Donald this is, <laughs> this is the worst thing you've ever written really oh, now no. not obviously they're very kind about it as they always are but I realized it was going to take a huge amount of work to make it publishable and I, I just couldn't face it and so I said I'm going to write a different novel very quickly and so I had to use a very strict modular structure mm. so that it wouldn't go off on any mad tangents because I had no time to do <laughs> it. Way, way over my um, deadline and uh, well, went to my events as well so it was kind of, it was crass considerations in yeah. play. but it worked out thank god Wow, good, I, hope I, that, like I hope that. that other book works out eventually too. I don't think it will, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad it exists anyway. I feel you know, like, I, I, I think that's really interesting that you felt the need to put like limitations and constraints on your characters because mm -hmm. I did want to come back to the question of character for both of you because mm -hmm. that is something I think that, that really stands out in both works is that, that you both 
create such such richly drawn characters and they really do feel very alive on the page in different ways. Um, so yours, Donald, were so alive that you had to give them rules so they didn't wander off and do anything weird. Wander off. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I, I mean, I was thinking... Uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Rob. No, no, go on, Donald. I'm just going to... There's a bit of a delay, you know. So. <laughs> You're Please. up, Donald. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, as I started to write, just to say about the chapters being all the exact same length, um, mm -hmm. it occurred to me that every day of our lives um, yeah. is the exact same length. It takes the exact same amount of time for the Earth to rotate once in its axis every single time. And some days of our lives, things happen that become part of the fabric of our souls. And other days, you know, you wake up and you kiss your kids goodbye and you go to work and nothing which happens and the day is forgettable. You know, there'll be a day in your life that will be the last day of your life. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, it's one rotation of the, of the planet. Absolutely. And so that, so it, it, it didn't seem, it seemed actually very natural for each um, vignette to be the exact same length because of just of that, you know, the, the modular nature of this itself, you know, the fact that we're constrained by the Planck constants in time and, and matter. And Planck so constant, it seemed, yeah. <laughs> I know, I just, I, I just read about that actually. Yeah, days ago. me too. Yeah. <laughs> Did you read that book, Helgoland, by Car ah, yeah, Carlo Rovelli? <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, I just I wrote, read that as well. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Because okay. it's going on about it's trying to make quantum physics understandable for yeah. It's probably, it's like three pages, it is, but... Yeah. That's good. And how about yourself? You to, how did you feel kind of bringing these characters to life? Did they emerge fully formed? Have they been inside of you for a while? You know? Some of them emerged quicker than, yeah. and some of them emerged incredibly slowly. Um, some of them, I sort of, like yourself, I sort of got to a point where I'd overwritten something and then I mm -hmm. threw it out and I started again. And, um, you know, and there's, yeah, uh, you know, there's a lot of detritus, I think. And you sort of, I, had to, I had to become okay with that. That I might have I started off a thing or or there was a section of a story that was going to be in it and and then I had to just accept the fact that even though I like this bit, it has no place overall mm. and you know all that stuff. But yeah, um, I uh, you know I really really for me t t I really loved going on long walks you mm -hmm. know and sort of visualizing the story as a a tiny thing, zooming out the lens massively. And looking at it and going, you know, what about what happened 10 minutes before this story started? Which mm. is the kind of thing, of course, you do in acting as well. As yeah. you, know, you, sort of, you don't just start from the point where it's, where it's like, you know, scene one. You know, you sort of, mm -hmm. you can, if, if you're going to write a character or perform a character, you have to, you have to give them uh, as much basis, give them as much flesh and bone mm -hmm. as, as is possible. I heard this great thing Daniel Day-Lewis said about acting. He said, you know, there's, it's impossible to, to portray a character before I've had at least maybe six months of just marinating on them, mm. you know? And I thought, wow, that's... Because anything less he would regret for the rest of his life, you right. know? Yeah, yeah. And I thought, that's a really, that's an incredibly hard, good work ethic that man has, you know? <laughs> Because it's like anything, the longer you spend thinking about something, the more, uh, the more it reveals itself to you, you know, mm -hmm. the more flexible and human they become, you yeah. know. And uh, so I suppose in that regard, the acting thing was very, very uh, useful to me approaching writing, yeah. because I thought, well, it's the same principle, really. You know? mm -hmm. um, but I probably, you know, I probably had a little bit too much time to write this book, <laughs> to be honest. Too much and not enough at the same time, you know? So we're, I was reading it, I came in on a plane today, I was reading it, and I really was loving it, you know, I was still really loving it, I'm still very, very proud of it. And then there's parts of it where you go, <laughs> I would have. I would have I would have worded that better. Uh -huh. you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember reading this thing about Ray Bradbury, and he uh, Fahrenheit four five one was his first book that he he wrote, and he wrote it in about ten or twelve days, really quickly. In fact, he ra he ran to a library, and there was a sort of a typewriter that you put coins into, right back mm -hmm. in his day. And so he just whacked out the whole book in like less than two weeks oh on this coin operated typewriter in the <laughs> libraries. Fucking hell, <laughs> Jesus! I mean, think of, think of the luxury of technology that we have today. But he, he, oh yeah, after after he'd, him and his pal was just walking along on, the, on a boulevard in Los Angeles, and some police pulled up 
wound the window down and gone, what are you doing? And they were like, nothing. We're just walking along the street. And he was like, they were like, yeah, go home. Right, just screamed. And they were like, what the fuck? And that's sort of this, I, this, this sort of shock that he'd gotten from a person in authority. He just ran to the library and wrote this book, Fahrenheit 451, about corrupt authoritarian mm. figures, you know. And uh, what was my point about all that? Oh yeah, yeah, that he'd, <laughs> he'd, gone, he'd gone back to four, Fahrenheit 451 years later and was like, oh, this bit, oh, this bit. But then, you know, what can you do? You have to just, you know, you have to just accept mm -hmm. the fact that it's, it's At some point paper. the work goes into the world, yeah. Yeah, so I suppose the there is a deadline which is incredibly yeah. helpful and motivating and I tried to, I tried to fill as, uh, each character up with as much richness as I possibly could, mm -hmm. you know. And sometimes, you know, you'd be, you know, you'd be making some toast or whatever and a, f a funny something would sort of kind of drift into your head. And you go, that could be good for, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. Salvador or whatever, you know, whatever. The thing would just sort of drift in and then kind of drift down and find its place, you know, if it had one in the book. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to learn to trust myself, you know. I, 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 I read this cool thing that William Burroughs said where he said, even when he was a junkie, he trusted his own subconscious. <laughs> really, like, he'd been a junkie for 20 yeah. years, you know, just like... That's really interesting. Yeah, he said, yeah. like, I'm not going to worry that I can't remember something or, you know, I, know I need this piece of information. I need to control it. Mm -hmm. He said, if I just ask myself a question, it, the answer would come. You know, it might take a day, it might take yeah. six hours, it might take a week, depending on how much heroin I've consumed. <laughs> But it, the answer does come in yeah. the end, and it's like you know, the, 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 and in that sense, the mind is far, far bigger than we give it credit for in our moments of doubt. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's amazing to have built up that that trust in your own voice, because I feel like that's definitely your like as you were talking about your experience coming to writing, where emerging writers will will stumble as is they'll start to get into that, and then they'll second guess what's being produced or yeah. what's coming up. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. we're gonna we're gonna take some questions from the audience, but before that, I just wanted to ask one more question of you, Robert, if well. that's okay. Um, you mentioned acting as being really valuable uh, and rich in terms of a place to draw on for these stories, <coughs> um, and that definitely came to mind when I was reading them. But I, I I wanted to know how it felt for you because acting, though acting, you know, you're creating a character within yourself, and then you're yeah. using your body and and your voice to perform that. To, to people, it's also a very collaborative practice, especially yeah. on TV. I mean, it's like the, yeah. the crews are huge, there's a writing process, things yeah. are being rewritten, there's directors, there's effects it's now. chaos, yeah, pure um, chaos, making television. How, like, how is it to, to move from that to a really, really solitary yeah. creative practice where actually you yeah. are the puppet master? The you can be yeah. like, and now there's a dragon, and now you're green. You don't have to yeah. get anybody else involved. Yeah, you know? the solitude was, D difficult. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was difficult to go to a, pl a to a place of sort of creative seclusion, mm -hmm. having spent my entire adult life and before that creating, you know, on a stage, you know, with a few other people going, you know, what about this? Yeah, yeah. And sort of, uh, and uh, yeah, that was very, very hard, and still is, you know, yeah. still is. I'm writing something else now, and it's like it's it's hard because for me, you know. I'm sure you, you've experienced something similar, Donald, where you know, you're right and you feel a breakthrough happen, a silent yet exhilarating breakthrough. <laughs> you go, brilliant, I've just made this book better. Now yeah. I've, just, oh, I've just done so, oh, it's really... And uh, you, you kind of go... <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, absolutely. So I just, sometimes yeah. a publisher, I just send them stuff that I've done that day, just oh, because yeah. it, just for the process of sharing it mm -hmm. you know um, but then again a lot of acting preparation especially when you get into making telly and yeah, yeah. making films and stuff in fact there's a graph you could draw between the budget of something versus the amount of rehearsal in advance that they that they do and f ironically the more money they have the less rehearsal that you do <laughs> It, it boggles my mind. If I, if I leave any legacy on this earth in acting, I will hope to try to put rehearsal of the actors back into television and film. Have you ever been on these streaming platforms and you click three or four different TV series and they're all acted shit? Sorry, but it's true. You know, there's just, 
there's just this profound lack of preparation going on, you know, yeah. and there's a lot of them are young, you know, and they're not bad actors, but they're probably not bad, but they need a bit of preparation. But the culture of making television and films, the larger the budget, the less the rehearsal for the actors. It's That's like, mad. it's literally like, you know, it's watching a TV series, the difference between like riding a bicycle and riding a bicycle, you know, it's yeah. like, it, it's, just, it's like they put so much fucking money into these things, <laughs> but yet the voices that are delivering the story and the everything, it's, you know, on ca in front of the camera, yeah. haven't been prepped correctly, yeah. you know? Do you know what that like, reminds me of in, um, in writing, actually, and Donald, you'll probably have an experience of this, that often when a writer gets more and more famous, the bigger the fame, the less the, the, less the edit. Yeah. Um, because they're like, well, you can write what you like, it doesn't matter. And you're like, you know, it probably still needs a little bit of editing. Hubris, once yeah. again. <laughs> Indeed. I tell you, it's, it's Indeed. can lead to a lot of waste of money. Yeah. Have you but, read any work by Emer McBride? No. Okay, so she's an Irish writer. Don't, you probably know her work. Yeah, I know um, her well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, so her first book was called A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing, and her second book oh, is yeah. The Lesser Bohemians, and she, she's trained as a stage actor. Oh, yeah. And so the way that she talks about her writing practice, I just think you would really like because she talks about, she writes in a very experimental style, very like kind of almost behind stream of consciousness, like before mm -hmm. the thought is even a sentence. Um, and she talks about how she wants the words on the page to do what an actor would do on the stage. Yeah, and wow. she's also an incredible reader. So right. I think you'd love her. I'll check her, yeah, yeah the Emer McBride. Yeah. Here, before we throw it out to the audience, Donald, I just wanted to ask you, <laughs> I'm trying to exploit you now for, uh, <laughs> for tips. But you know, the first I'm, audience I'm, question is from Robert. Yeah, from me. <laughs> He's coming to us from London. I'm, you know, I, I, um, I'm in an edit at the moment, and I, I, you know, sometimes it's, you know, little mini breakthroughs, but often it's, it's like wading through mud at the same time. <laughs> I love the flow and all that, that instantaneous exhilaration, but the, but the focused creativity of the edit. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm back kind of struggling on, and I, I'm doing it, you know, just sort of painstakingly slowly, but thinking there's definitely a better way to do this, you know? And I just wondered, you know, broad strokes wise, when you, you know, when you, end, when you have all the raw material in place kind of thing, what do, you know, do, what do you do in terms of approaching <laughs> it to sort of refine it? Well, I leave it for ages um, and I, I abandon it and, I usually kind of sulk, um, and the, it doesn't need, it's, it's perfect the way it is. Um, and then I send it off from the editor, and then he sends back loads of notes, and my first reaction is always oh, really, really violent. I was going, that's fucking bullshit, that all those notes are bullshit. <laughs> Brilliant and then, so far. And then, I, and then and Marie says to me, just shut up, um, and stop giving out, and sit down and do it. And it literally is just a, a real slog, you know, yeah. um, trying to, um, you know, to, to, to be mechanical about language, and yeah. to be mechanical about plot and to actually try to make intricacies as good as they can be. It can be a real slog, but gratifying in the end. But you know, yeah. it, it's kind of late at night um, yeah. and a spare time kind of work because it's just, you know, it feels as though you've done the hard work, but then you realize the hard work just starts when it comes to actually making the thing readable and publishable, you know, and making it fit for a bookshelf. I don't think this is what he wants to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's this this no big revelation in here. Tell me that, you know, that's it, that's what it is, yeah. 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 There's, no, I mean, there's, no, there's no prescriptive or proscriptive list you can give to somebody and say, this is how you do it. You know, you just have to just do it. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, it, it kind of goes against the whole idea of teaching creative writing, but I think like every writer is so different and everybody has a different ambition and a different style and a different um, way of telling their stories. So I think all you can do really is try to make somebody as happy as possible about the whole process um, and, you know, <laughs> It's, uh, that's really like it's, that's, that's the essence of it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's why I mean, it's so important. Like, good editors and good readers are so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I feel like you guys have touched on the idea of a first reader a lot, actually, in this conversation. The idea that you know, there's, you need someone who's going to give you honest feedback and really tell you if something is good or not. But then you also there's almost like a like a, a reader zero. That's the person who you show it to where you're like, I did something. And then they're like, good job. That's yeah. great. Yeah. They're yeah. always going to tell you it's good no matter what. And you kind of need both, right? Yeah. That, that being told it's good prematurely can be kind of dangerous too, I think, when you, yeah. when you get that feedback from the universe. You yeah. Go, yeah, yeah like, I'm I've, done, I've done the thing. Great. Yeah. You know, and you can well, sort of draw a line under it. Yeah. My, my wife actually has, she has a range of that's greats. Um, and there's a... <laughs> 
<laughs> my delight is. And, and what I'm really looking for, and she knows how to deliver them. She'll always say, yeah, that's great. Or, um, oh. But sometimes she'll go, oh my God, that's great. Um, and I know the first that's great is, is shit. And the, the, that's great. <laughs> Teary-eyed, or you know, has like maybe bloodless, or has has had some kind of reaction that I can see um, because I stand at an oblique angle from her. She reads, so I'm kind of almost behind her, but I'm watching all the time for a certain oh change in her aspect. Oh my god! <laughs> she, she's great. Like she's, she's so a patient, saint. such a great reader. Here, did you guys get our postcard, by the way, from Sicily? Thanks a million, Rob, for that. <laughs> oh, that's all right. No worries. Yeah. We sent you, we sent um, yourself and Mary a, a postcard from Catania in Sicily when I was, what was that, last year, last no, last, when was that now? What, is, what month is it? It's November. It's in my literary archive now. It was November. a year ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, nice. We recorded for posterity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yeah, we should yeah. probably take some questions from the audience. Oh, I, yeah. I want to give everyone a chance. Uh, we have a question down here at the front. We have roving microphones, so if you could wait until the microphone reaches you on the way <laughs> um, and if anyone else has questions you can put up your hand and I will start to get a little rota on the works so I've just taken a photo here because I'll go home tomorrow to tip and I'll say I was on stage last night in London which meant Robert Sheehan and someone will go you were yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh I wanted to do a little photo or a video or something for Pat McCabe as well who sends his you know um, his droll love and uh, I don't have my phone on me. That's do you have your phone on you? I, d I do. Do you want me to take a picture of you? Do you mind if, it, if I do a quick video on it? And you, you all say... Sure. Uh, Wish you were here, Pat. <laughs> all right, here you go. Really? W would you do that for me? Yeah. You have to press the record button. Okay, that's okay. Video as, as ironically as you can muster. Right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Three, two, one. Hang on, is that, is that filming? Uh, I don't know, let's see. Oh. Wish you were here, Pat. Oh, that's so lovely. I don't. <laughs> brilliant. Beautiful. Yeah, I can send that to you. That's um, brilliant. Thanks okay. for that. Would you like to ask a question? <laughs> yeah, please. Hi, is this on? Yeah, it's on. Um, Donal, hi. I'm from Thurless, actually. Hi, and you um, I'm concerned about the notion of voice and the way you explained. So I have the Thurless voice. I have the London voice, where I've lived for 20 years. I have the United States voice, where I've live, also lived, right? And there's the voice that, um, sort of the critical voice, which looks on. So I can relate to your writing in that I have the Thurless voice, which is the first person voice, and it's core, and it's honest, and it's real. But I don't know which, <laughs> I, so I'm a journalist, I'm a pr producer here, so I use the critical voice a lot. But I want to try to return to the sort of voice you've got, but I have no clue how to get back to that. Because my head rules now. Oh, I'd say you need to go back to journalists then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you get plenty of internalists. Well, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. All the best people come from Thurlis. That's the perfect, uh, like, emigrant, emigre response. You have to go home. <laughs> That's the only possible answer. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying? It's difficult, yeah. right? It's well, it diff absolutely is. Actually, just ironically, um, I had one of my most terrifying experiences when it comes to voice in Thurlis, in the Source <laughs> Art Centre, um, because I was reading, I was asked to read a story I wrote called Long Puck, which is set in Ham in Syria. Uh -huh. And I was asked to read it to a group of Syrian people, a, a theatre full of Syrian people who um, had settled in Turles and halfway through the story I was thinking Jesus I just googled Ham you know uh, I googled it and I realized it's mostly the suburbs are kind of dusty and dry and this, this, this center is a kind of vibrant marketplace and that's all I know about it um, and I went off half cocked and wrote the story set in the town so my voice is going to just be ridiculous and if, when I finished the story um, a thirdless woman stood up and said, Donald, as you said, I'm very concerned about the voice of your story. I just don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and thank God, um, a Syrian lady just saved my ass. She said, oh, I have to contradict you. I'm sorry, but it, I'm surprised to hear Donald hasn't been to Syria because he just got it so right. And oh, she was just being kind, I know. <laughs> oh, just, that was so amazing. She bailed me out, yeah, yeah. That's very nice. No, 
but you clearly you took 10 years you were hanging out in your flat uh, doing other things so you struggled so so just give me the quick fix on this <laughs> <laughs> quick one donald I, like literally, literally, I just wrote in my own actual voice. Like literally, I wrote in the voice of my friends and family. And I mean, the characters in my first book were mostly involved in um, building work, and and I had been as well. And and I worked in meat factories, and so I drew on those kind of, I suppose you could say, the rough energies and the kind of locutions of guys who work in building sites and guys who slaughter cattle for a living. You know, um, guys, my own friends and family um, and relatives. Um, and so, literally, I just tried to reproduce the sounds and the structures of that kind of speech. But, you know, you can't just lob it onto the page. Um, yeah. There's always that artifice, that, that mm -hmm. place between narrative and actual um, speech that you have to try to occupy. Yeah. So you're in this kind of interstitial space between a voice being very real and a voice being contorted in order for your story to be told properly. Because, I mean, it was pointed out to me that in, in the, the second page of The Spinning Heart, the main character describes um, his friend's sun-dried, lime-burned flesh, um, and he's supposed to be delivering a monologue as the foreman of the building site. And there's no way that he, in, real in reality, would have described his friend's hand as, as having sun-dried, lime-burned flesh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But then I was thinking, but I worked in building sites, and I, I'd say sun-dried, lime-burned flesh, so it's okay, but you know, it's kind of, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of not in a way either. <laughs> yeah. We probably have time for one more very pithy question or Can very quickly one quick more one. Sasha from online we've got, oh, uh, uh, got a friend a from, from the US Tiffany Chang has written in she's an American entomologist what's what that question so you're about to bugs. find out Rob so she's an books. expert in bugs. insects and she asks and I paraphrase about your relationship with cockroaches can you elaborate please <laughs> cockroaches specifically <laughs> Robert I'm not in a relationship with a cockroach eh? <laughs> you know any cockroach relationships have been very fleeting in my life <laughs> I feel like there's something I'm missing here. Yeah, me too. That, yeah. <laughs> why, insects, why cockroaches? The wide, the wide, it was around the imagery and the use of insects and the imagery of insects oh. in your short in, story. In the book? Yes. Yeah. She's mixed up with Kafka. I can't remember uh, writing <laughs> about book. I mean, there's a lot of snake stuff in the, in the book, weirdly. I don't, How do you, you feel know. about snakes? You know, uh, it's f apparently quite strongly in <laughs> my subconscious. <laughs> there's, there's, uh, there's like three... There's three stories that have some very strong snake themes, um, and the <laughs> publisher was very, very uh, um, insistent that I spread those out and keep them very far away from each other. So I put them right next to each other. Right. And uh, just in case the snakes get any ideas, they have to work together. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, as a sort of yeah, yeah, it's kind of variation on it. I guess theme. as an Irish person, you know. But I can't. Snakes. I don't. I can't remember any um, any insects in the book. And he's certainly not cockroaches. What's that? The Oh shit! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be honest, that one and the other one, I'm trying to kind of keep on the back burner because of the sexual abuse. Okay, yours. But uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, House in the Country is a short story from the perspective of uh, he's about ten years old, I think, and he's. He lives in a, a rural house in uh, the countryside in Ireland, which is owned by this sort of abusive, eccentric American character who is a hoarder. And um, he, uh, so there's just cockroaches everywhere. <laughs> there's cockroaches on the television. Yeah, there's a cockroach called Hootie who sits on the TV to get a suntan. And um, yeah, so I, you know, I don't really have, I, I, I think probably snakes are deeper in my psyche than cockroaches. I think cockroaches was just a thing I used to, uh, to, to really viscerally demonstrate how disgusting this house is <laughs> that, this, that this kid lives in. Sure, you know? yeah. <laughs> Listen, lads, I think this is about all we've got time for, but uh, this was an absolutely glorious conversation. It was. A lovely time. It's so enjoyable. Yeah, don't Me know, too. thank you for joining us from the ether. Thank you uh, from the ether. Really for joining us from the ether. And thank you to all of you. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, um, it is like absolutely impossible to do an event at an Irish Writers Weekend without being like, boola bus, boola bus, lads. Boola bus. Boola Round bus. of applause. Um, but yeah, we'll now head over to the British Library proper. So there will be a signing, as mentioned before. You can come meet Robert, have a wee chat. Uh, you can just maybe like 
text Donal <laughs> your thanks. We'll pass it on. Tweet Donal. Tweet Donal. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure Donal's on Twitter. Are you on social media, Donal? No, um, my wife is on Twitter, kind of on my behalf, really. Okay, um, yeah. Well, you, you can tweet on. Donal's wife yeah. if you enjoy the event. Yeah. <laughs> um, and thank you to everyone who watched online. Uh, yeah, thanks very yeah. much, lads. Love to her from Augustina and I. Love to her. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Alexa.